Hi, we're here at Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2019 with Dion Olsthorn, a.k.a. Dion, a.k.a. Dionoid. You've got two games here, actually. Right. You, you've got uh, a new release that's on cartridge, in box, yeah. Amoeba Jump, and you've got Tower of Rubble. Um, maybe tell me a little bit about your history with programming, and then yeah. your history with the Atari 2600 as well. Okay. Okay, so uh, my history in programming, when I was young, uh, my, I got like a Commodore 64, so I me, never... Me too. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like this one. Oh, I, yeah. I never owned a machine like this when I was young. Um, and I, I think I sold the Commodore 64, I moved to Amiga, uh, kept on programming, but more like serious stuff uh, now I'm, I'm a software engineer that's my profession so i'm into programming um, and about two years ago i decided to buy an old commodore 64 because i was thinking i just like to see the machine see if i can make another game for that machine yeah. because so, I, so you've made games in the past for the 64 um uh, yeah i made some basic games uh that, that use a bit of assembly to okay. speed up things, but I was really bad at it. Yeah. Um, like a joystick routine or a graphics right. routine? I, I think I was like 13, 14 oh. back in the days. Yeah. Uh, there was no internet, um, so yeah. all the information I got from friends, and it was like half-half information. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I like creating games, so I created also a game for uh, the iPhone and the Android, which is like a, a little simple game um, I, I saw the game Flappy Bird. I'm not sure if you remember that. Oh yeah, very well known in North America. Okay. Very well known. Okay, and that, that really caught my eye. I was thinking, okay, I, I think I can make a game like that, uh, which, which I did. Okay. Uh, it's, it's called Ring Diver. Oh. Um, but the thing is, I cannot show you the game anymore because oh. um, I had to pay like $100 a year to be in the Apple Store. That's what you have to pay. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you, so you released it online? I, no, I released it in the Apple Store and I paid like 100 bucks for one time, one oh, year, okay. and there were no ads in the game. Oh. So the next year they asked like for another 100 bucks and I was saying, yeah, <laughs> I created this game just for people to play and not to, I don't want to pay 100 bucks every year. That's, it's yeah. gonna cost me too much money. <laughs> it's not a not a charity game. You're not paying right. to for other people's enjoyment. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> it, it it was a one year. I got some good feedback, mostly from friends, from family, yeah. uh, and then it got retracted. So the, I have nothing anymore. So I was thinking, I need something physical, like yeah. an actual game on a floppy disk or something like that. Yeah. So I, I was telling. I I bought another Commodore 64 two years ago. Something like that. Uh, learned assembly again. Uh, I picked it up rather quickly. I'm, I'm a software engineer, so it's... Just another language to you. It's another language, and I'm, I'm the type of guy that reads the whole menu and then starts something. So it's just uh, like, yeah. I read about all the, the instructions of assembly, and I said, oh, okay, I can do this. Um, and while I was learning that, that uh, I, I, there's like an on, online course on Commodore 64 programming. And... Um, on, on one of these courses, they tell something about uh, counting the cycles of uh, uh, instructions you write. Yeah. And they say, well, that's what people do when you, provide, uh, you, you make Atari games. And they mention that there, there's a book like uh, uh, Racing the Beam. An excellent book. Anybody who has, has any interest in Atari 2600 and has not read that book, you definitely should read that oh, book. Okay. So long story short, I read the book. I was amazed, like, this is an unreal limited system but it's using the same cpu yeah. like 6502 kind of yeah. um, so i bought an atari yeah. then i joined atari age and i was overwhelmed with all the information there to help me create a game uh, like you have uh, uh, daryl spice jr he has like um, a, a course like an, a tutorial of creating a game yeah uh, collect collect yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Andrew Davey has like a, a book or an, an online, excellent, yeah. Yeah. and I was kind of sold, so I, I tried to create my first kernel, it worked, and I, I fell in love with the machine, basically. So had you ever played the 2600 back in the day, or you yeah. just, this is no. brand new to you? It's, it's brand new. That and is I, incredible. I, I didn't know any, I hadn't any friends with an Atari. We had some uh, Philips system in the Netherlands. Uh, oh, okay. 
Um, so it was yeah. maybe it wasn't popular there. It wasn't that popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah like a failed system, and most people had like the Commodore 64. So I like the switch, and I like yeah, yeah programming, assembly, uh, creating games. I, I like the. What I really like is all the feedback you get when creating a game. Um, yeah, we, we, we talked about this. It's excellent to show your game, uh, maybe on your stream. Yeah. People respond, uh, even on the Atari H forums. They, they get feedback, they say, yeah. I like this, I don't like that. Yeah. That's why I do it for. I like people playing my games. It's yeah. it really give me a boost. So, you said you, you read the book Racing the Beam. Um, what specifically attracted you to the 2600 when you're reading that book? Was it the, was it, it the tight uh, clock, clock counting, the cycles that you had to yes. be really, really wary of? Yeah, exactly. It was about um, drawing a line and, and I, in the beginning I didn't even get it from reading the book. They say you have to program every line and that's basically what you do. Yeah. Um, and I remember when I when I switched from Commodore 64 kind of programming starting that and switched to Atari, I was really confused with um, how to program. Like uh, on a Commodore 64, you have a sprite and it yeah. has like a width and a height and an X and a Y. Yeah. And um, and then I moved to Atari and they say, yeah, you have a sprite, but it's it's <laughs> one pixel height. And I was like, what? Why? Why? Yeah, and yeah. then after a while it clicks, it's like, okay, I have to draw the sprite every line yeah. and, and feed it with new information. It, Which is limiting but also liberating at yeah. the same time. You yeah. can draw the whole screen with one sprite, the exactly. full full length of it. On, on the Commodore 64 you have like the borders and they're kind yeah. of limiting you. Yeah. You can get rid of the borders, of course, but... Uh, yeah, you have so much power yeah. on the Atari 2600, right. but at the same time you don't. So it's it's a push and pull, and it's so unique. It's like the Vectrex. It is. It's such yeah. a unique system that no other system is like that, where you draw directly to the screen. Exactly. And and the thing I really loved also was the Stella emulator. So I, uh, yeah. I I started with that, and I really like when you go to debug mode. You can step through your code, yes. um, see everything that's on your screen, like the P1, P P0, all the the missiles. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It is. They've done a really good job with Stella. Yeah. yeah. And I, I could look into games that other people made and look like which objects they used. It's like, ah, oh, they used the missile for this? Oh. Yeah. And then they, they switch uh, yeah. back and forth to make that work. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. really interesting how that's yeah. done. So it's been about one and a half years since you kind of announced Amoeba Jump. Yeah. Um, and now it's right over there. It is. Yeah. Sitting in on a cartridge in a box yeah. in the Atari H booth, uh, making its debut at Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Yeah. Is this something that you thought of, that you envisioned, that it would ever, and you hoped that it would end up on a cartridge? Um, I, that, I, let me see. I, I didn't think of, of writing a game just to release it on cartridge. More like, oh, I want to write a game, get it on Atari H forum, so people can play it. Um, and I remember sending an email to L from Atari saying um, I want to use the save key. Um, and uh, as basically save key you can save your information somewhere in a big index. Uh, but that's like a list saying which game uses which index on the save key so you won't override each other's high scores, stuff like that. That's right. So I emailed L saying uh, can you can you reserve me a spot on that list somewhere? And he said yeah of course. And I like your game, and if if you're okay, I, I would like to put it on a cartridge. Or uh, and I was like, uh, yeah, and yeah. and it and there was a lot of excitement about your game when you released it. I, as soon as I saw it, yeah. I was like, this this is so simple, but yet so addictive, and right. and right. You, you can just pick it up and go. Anybody can pick it up and understand the game right away. Yeah. And um, so t tell us a little bit about the the background and the development and how you came about to making that game, because it is a port. It is a port, right. Yeah. Um, and, and when I bought my Commodore 64 and I I said to my wife, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about creating a game for this system. Um, I'm not sure what what kind of game. And she said, well, maybe maybe look at Doodle Jump, something like that. Yeah. And I was looking at Doodle Jump thinking, okay, this is simple. It's like platform, can do that. 
then in the meantime I, I moved to the Atari right. and I was like yeah this should be doable um, right. because you, you understood uh, the abilities and of the Atari 2600 yeah I was, and, I was and it, kind of learning also at the same time um, and, and vertical games are actually very, very good for scrolling on yeah. the 2600. Horizontal, a yeah. little bit harder, right. but vertical, yeah. no problem at all. So, yeah, and right. It's, it's vertical, it's, it's doable, right? And um, I, I, I think I started with the, the bounce of the, the little doodle at that time yeah. still. Uh, because that's what you do in, in Commodore 64 games. You have like a table with, with uh, uh, all kind of values to have like a, 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 a sinus value jump yeah uh, so I started with that and so I had like a little doodle jumping on the platform right so you had um, the, that kernel going and working yeah yeah so I started with a kernel added things um, and then became better at, at writing assembly yeah. so I could shrink my kernel a little bit and then add new things to it basically oh that's that's because you have to end up with with uh, 76 cycles on every line um, that's right that's yeah. a magic number there and then i found out little things while i was uh, looking through the atari edge forums like you can do a w sync um, which is normally what you do when you're clo we are closing the end of your line but you can actually just skip that and take it out and just go use that cycle instead of calling the W scene. Yeah, fill, fill in the gaps, like no, yeah. no ops or, or whatever you want to do. Maybe some calculations if you, right. if you have time for it, yeah. yeah. Or set up, set up the next line. Right, exactly. Th that's what I did, yeah. Um, so now you're working on your second homebrew, which is here as well, Tower, Tower of Rubble, Rubble yeah. which is also uh, a port, an yeah. incredible port. What, sh what drew you to this game after making, or, or what, what made you want to make a second game? Uh, yeah, uh, when I was finishing uh, Amoeba Jump, um, I uh, um, okay. So Al said, "Well, you can, if you like, you can. Uh, uh, I can release your game on Atari Edge." I was yes, I'm, I'm happy with that. Oh yeah. So I asked uh, Nathan Strum to create the artwork, uh, the, the artwork and the box for for the game, yeah. um, which he did an excellent job on. Um, yeah. Um, He's a master at, at box art and, and artwork in general. By the time I didn't know that even. Yeah, <laughs> really. So he, he was involved with all those games. Because so he reached out to you? No, I reached he, out to him. Um, just randomly? Uh, no, I, yeah. what I did, there's something like, do they do still do that for new games? They have like a challenge where... Uh, once in a while they do have box art challenges. Yeah, yeah so uh, there was like a past challenge for Space Rocks by Daryl Spice Jr. Yeah. And I was looking through all the things that people created there, and I was thinking, oh, I really like this one. <laughs> Nathan Strum, okay, let's, <laughs> let's try to mail him. And then he replied, yeah, I'm happy to do that, and I like your game, and, uh, but he was very busy. I oh. didn't know that. Was like, yeah, he's busy with other games. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, I've got the time, I'll wait. And then in the meantime, I've, I had time to pick something new up uh, yes, okay. and that's when I read your message on Facebook saying look this is a game uh, there's a port created for the Comedy 64 of uh, Tower of Rubble yep. um, and uh, it looks like something that could be portable to Atari and I was looking into the game into the I li really like the music of the game like oh, the sweet. rhythm of the falling pebble sure. Sure. Yeah. And I, I was kind of sold when I saw that I said yes um, so I think you had the same reaction as I did when I saw it. It's like, this is an amazing game. All the elements can be done in, yeah. on the 2600. And I just, it's very... I, I, I started differently. So with, with Amoeba Jump, I just started coding. Right. There was, um, with Tower of Rubble, it took like, I think, a week to write down on paper what the little man can do and what all the, the movements of, of, uh, yeah, of, of, of the sprites are. Yeah. Uh, to write down the rules. Uh, and it's actually very unusual that somebody suggests a game to be ported and it actually happens because there's so many people going, right. oh, I want, I wish so I could make this game. Could somebody make this game for me? Yeah, yeah. And um, so it's it's very unusual for that to happen. Right. And so normally developers say, well, if, if you're do it yourself or uh, I've got other game ideas. But it's, this was like perfect. It was Thank you. Yeah, it was at the right time, I guess. At the right time. Yeah, yeah. Now that you've done two ports, yeah. um, is that a is that a trend? Is that something that you like doing, or it just oh boy? 
uh, something just fell over there. Um, yeah. Or is that, or does it just happen to be two ports? Or do you have ideas that have you've come up with for games of yourself, for I, yourself? Yeah, I used to write some of my own games and port both. And um, like, like Tower of Rubble, it's it's a real port. It, it has its limitations because I don't have, it's not that wide as the original. Um, uh, but for Am Amoeba Jump, I kind of moved away from the original. Yeah. You kept the spirit of it. I yeah. kept the spirit, but it added some, some extra things like the little bacteria you have to collect and then make a word and then do a super jump, which yeah. is... Very old school kind of thing in the arcade yeah. where you collect bonus or I, extra. I combine some things there, yeah. yeah. Well, that's excellent. So, do you have ideas for a next one? Are you still concentrating on this? Oh, is it going to be I, a port? I, I, or? I do have ideas, but it's yeah. really, really early. Um, yeah. And it's it's a kind of idea that uh, uh, I, I think I need something extra to fit into the kernel. Um, right. There, there's like an existing game I, tr I try to do a port of, um, and it doesn't fit the kernel I've written. Uh, oh, so, okay. actually, John Champo is somewhere on the... On so I asked him, yeah. how does ARM development work? And how is it easy to do? How can I manage to do that? And so, so you'd be one of the very few people who actually do ARM development. I think there's Daryl Spice Jr. and, and John Champo and, and maybe a handful of others. So yeah, it's, I, it is a, a new world. It is. I, I just started looking into that. So yeah. with some help from, uh, from John. But yeah. it's, if it improves your game, it's it's nice to do, and and the the fun thing people say, well, it's 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 not challenging anymore. Uh, yeah. I, I, I talked to John. That's not the case. I think it's I, it kind of moves your challenge. So instead yeah. of trying to fit everything in your kernel, you, you still got that challenge because yeah. you're adding more stuff to your kernel, and you still have to fit it all in there. Uh, yeah. You've been here at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, hanging around your games. Uh, what has been the reaction? Uh, while well, you're, I mean, you to you too, is observing people playing, yeah, yeah. and also from the people playing them, because there's somebody over there playing Amoeba Jump right now. Right, right. Uh, it, it's different for the game. So, like for Tower of Rubble, um, most people have to get used to how to jump, like the movement of, of the little the little guy there. Um, and, and sometimes I just just stand like this, and I say, well, there, there's like a special jump you need to you need to know, and then you can cross the islands. Um, and then I say, well, I'm, I'm the developer, and they're like, oh, great, tell us more. Yeah. I guess that's a big surprise, like, oh my, you made yeah. this game. Yeah, yeah, people think it's cool when, when the developer is around to, to tell something about it. Oh, yeah. And I, I see Amoeba Jump, people pick it up very fast. It's like, oh, that's the way it works. Yeah. And um, it, it, people like the little things in games. I didn't realize it that much. Like, when the little Amoeba jumps, it it's opened its mouth, like, oh. Yeah. And, a lot of people said, oh, that's funny. Yeah. Like, or the sound when you go off a spring and it yeah. just and the screen's flashing by. It's, it's that... It's that it's the, little, the little things like that. that it's the extra little 5% that you add on to the yeah. end, to the yeah. game, that makes it really special. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful to be able to finally meet you because, I mean, you're coming from very far away. So this is very, very special to, to, to be able to yeah. interview you in person. Yeah. Yeah, and it's... And, then again, I said it before, thank you for doing the show, really, because as a developer, it really helps to improve my games. I like seeing people playing my actual game. Um, and it, it kind of looks like every week, some more people join your, your, your Twitch. So yeah. It keeps building and building, and I, and I love that too, because there's yeah. more attention to these wonderful, beautiful games that are being developed, you know, 41, 42 years now after the Atari 2600 has been released, it's still going very, very strong. It's one of the strongest homebrew communities out there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm really happy to be part of it and, and to be able to show your creations off and, and maybe spread the word a little bit more. Yeah, it's great. And I was just thinking, when I joined Atari Age, I think about the same time you also set up your Zero Page Homebrew uh, Twitch. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think what your your game was one of the earlier games that I played on the show. Okay, I, I was I was assuming you were there like for for ten years streaming <laughs> games, and then I found out oh he, he's just started this. Uh, yeah. So well, I've I've been been, I've been yeah. streaming online for like twenty years. Oh, okay, okay. So that helped a lot. So I was able to jump in 
and, and kind of I wanted a very high quality level uh, to be able to show off the games. Yeah. You know, I wanted an RGB system to have the highest quality output, yeah. and I I wanted to do the justice to the great games that that were being played. So Excellent. maybe it had, and I'm great that it had the appearance of I've always been there, yeah. <laughs> and that's <laughs> awesome to hear. So yeah, thank yeah. you so much. And, and thank you for, for the interview. It's been wonderful talking to you. And I can't wait to see what you come up with next, arm chip or no arm chip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let's see. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's see. We're working on finishing uh, this game and then... Uh, oh, and how close are you to uh, finishing this uh, Tower of Rubble? It's pretty feature complete, isn't it's it? kind of feature complete. I want to add little things like some sound effects, uh, two-player mode, enhance it a bit, add some extra text to it, some extra visuals. So a lot of the polish at polish. the end. Yeah, basically. That's excellent. I think a few more months, basically, still. <laughs> In time for Christmas. No, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe not. No, no, maybe not. Next year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So excellent. Thank you so much for coming, and um, thank you for talking to me. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. Uh, till next time. I'm not sure if I'm here next year, but. Um, yeah. I'll be here. You'll be here. No matter what. <laughs> I, I had four hours, two hours sleep last night, so I can make it here at a four o'clock plane ride. So I, I definitely will make it here next year. So thank you so much. Thank you, James.